Alright, we're back to making some more videos because I have lots more things to share with you and I've had some requests, um, actually not from the class, but from a friend of mine, Sylvia Caldwell, out in British Columbia about tools for doing to make. And I think it's fantastic that there's um, people reaching out from all over the place. Uh, Sylvia and I know each other from back in school and we actually had this conversation saying, Wait a second, did we learn all of this stuff when we went in our undergrad 20 years ago? And the answer was a resounding no. So those of you who are following along this course in Niagara College's um, process engineering course, we have really been focused on the learning outcomes that are necessary for today's and tomorrow's workplace, and not just reflecting back on the curriculum as it was delivered before, and sticking to historical precedent, we want to make sure that you have those tools. And those of you who were in Norm's class last week where he said, uh, optimization of systems is everything. And I'm like, yes, Norm, you are the best. We are really honing in on all those tools that are useful. We did a previous video on check sheets and we're going to be referring back to that. So if you haven't watched the check sheet video, do make sure you take some time with that. So today we're going to talk about histograms as a quality measure and our learning outcomes will be at the end of this video, you will be able to discuss the role of ASQ or the American Society for Quality in standardizing methods for measuring quality. And we're going to be using some of ASQ's tools. We're going to de determine the quality parameters worth measuring for your product or process step and identify when a histogram is relevant. In particular, histograms are good for frequency data. We're going to use a histogram for evaluating data quality and we'll note the trends in histogram diagram data. And what does that mean? We're going to look at what do different types of histograms look like and be able to think about why we might see these in various situations. Oh, there's W. Edward Stubbing and his quote of the day for today is going to be lack of knowledge. Well, that is the problem. And so one of Deming's philosophies is that continuous improvement is not just about systems in manufacturing. It's not just about organizations. It is also about you and you can be continuously improving you and that PDSA cycle, plan, do, study, act can be about you. What is your plan? How are you going to do it? What do you need to learn and do to improve yourself? And once you've done it, how do you um, use those skills? And so honestly, learning more about the world is useful. I had to learn all of this so that I could deliver it for you and it's been fascinating and exciting for me to go through this journey with you. We've seen this slide before in other ones. We are focused on don't just burn toast. That's my mantra for this section of the class. We are investigating where problems are occurring, we're digging in and we're using appropriate measuring tools so that we can then predict and eliminate problems from occurring in the first place. And yes, these tools are relevant in food safety, but they're also relevant in quality and profitability. And so if you are reducing errors, so in the case of burnt toast, it's not a food safety issue, it's a loss of product and that's like, it's um, a quality issue and it's a loss of profitability. You are not making money when you're throwing out burnt toast. So how do you prevent errors from occurring in the first place so that you can keep your profit margins on that product. So as I mentioned before, we're working with some tools from ASQ and we're going to flip back and forth between um, some of the templates that are available. And I do highly recommend that you go to ASQ.org and take a look at their quality resources tab because they have a whole lot of different templates that you can use. My emphasis in this part of the course is not so much that we're going to be digging into the, the um, design within Excel for histograms. There are so many different templates for these tools out there. And uh, from my perspective, I want you as students to be able to leverage a useful template. ASQ provides some of those templates. There's a lot of them available through different websites. But to take that template, use it effectively, and be able to make justifications and recommendations based off of the types of data you may be putting into that template. 
So my emphasis is not on your Excel programming skills. It's on your ability to use relevant industry tools and then to be able to make judgments and recommendations based off of your observations within those tools. So I have already downloaded that template and pardon me, I'm going to escape out here. And now we saw the first template before and I'm actually jumping back to one of the templates that they put out, Check Sheet Histogram Pareto. We will revisit this chart because we, uh, as I mentioned before, in the video we did about check sheets, I had made up a imaginary check sheet based off of the mochi factory. <laughs> we keep bringing up the mochi factory. Um, and in there, there's a histogram. Now, this histogram is, it's good, but there's a better histogram template. So I highly recommend not relying on this as your histogram template. Do take the time to go into the actual histogram template, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But let's uh, go back to this check sheet. So remember, we we just took some of the core observations. If you were the um, end operator on a mochi rion filling uh, operation, and you were looking at the defects that were occurring in that process, you could be taking any of the defected product collecting it and then doing a quick evaluation on this check sheet saying, hey, which which of these different defects did we see? Did we see torn mochi, unsealed mochi, underweight, overweight? You could line up in your check sheet the types of defects that you're routinely seeing and then start to aggregate it out based off of when are you seeing it. In this case, we had it by dates. You could have it by different times within a shift. You could have it by different lines and so on. But these check sheets then can be um, if using the ASQ tool, it automatically sorts it to histogram by time. And this is a frequency table by time. Um, so we can see in this histogram, we're seeing most of the defects are occurring on Monday and Tuesday. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Wednesday in particular, we have a distinctive decrease in defects. And Thursday and Friday, it ramps back up. And we can then, using another tool, which we'll, we'll talk about in the next slideshow, we'll do some root cause analysis or Ishikawa analysis. We can start to ask questions, why are we seeing more defects on Monday and Tuesday as compared to Wednesday? And just some things off the top of my head, maybe our um, preventive maintenance and uh, mechanical is done on Tuesday night to Wednesday, making the calibration of the equipment much better. Perhaps we had different people working the shifts. Perhaps we had a temp worker on the line on Monday and Tuesday, but then we had our normal staff come back Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday people have the tendency to get sloppy because they're eager to get out of work fast and have the weekend off. You can have all sorts of different root cause analysis, and I don't want to dwell on it, but by sorting the data and seeing these trends, you can start to make different judgments about how you can manage the quality. Anytime you have a defect, the implication is that's a product that you can't sell and you're losing money and you're losing efficacy within your, with your process. Now, again, within this check sheet, there is also a bar chart where they're starting to sort out the defect counts and then a Pareto chart where they're sorting it by frequency and aligning it in a numerical order. We'll talk about Pareto charts in our next slideshow. But let's jump out to the second ASQ table. And this is a one that's very, very specifically for histograms. And in this case, if I go back to that previous chart here, the check sheet, let's go to that histogram. Um, pardon me, this, uh, I want the actual check sheet. We noted that one of the key errors that was occurring was overweight portions. Now, torn mochi and unsealed mochi dough, we could do numerical data on that, but it's more likely we're gonna collect numerical data on overweight portion. And I'd like to do a second study to see by how much are we overweight on this portioning. So let's say, we imagine doing a second study within our quality team to see how overweight we are because we want to know if we're giving away too much product 
or if that overweight is within a uh, very discrete margin, such that we know that we're not going to be flagged by Canadian Food Inspection Agency for underweight portioning. So let's say our ideal weight of a mochi should be 25 grams, and we go and do a study and we collect product off the line and we identify the weight. So we weighed out, in this case, we weighed out 60 portions of mochi. In this case, within this table, you just have to go in and type in, that was 24, seven and so on, you're typing it in, it automatically calculates the bins and the frequency for you. And the key feature that I want to talk about here, there are lots and lots of videos out there. I've produced some of my own on how to make a histogram from scratch. But again, my, my key takeaway from this video is that you can find many of these templates online if you're using one from an, a group like um, ASQ, you know that it is designed specifically for quality measurements of this sort. In this case, I really want the students, especially the students at Niagara College, to think about what is the implication of the data that I'm seeing. In this case, I can see that my central tendency is leaning in towards 26.2, and we really are only seeing a very few occurrences that are underweight. And that goes back to our check sheet from before. Go back to that check sheet. Our underweight portions were pretty low. What would be interesting for me as a quality manager would be to know if an underweight portion was also a portion with a bubble in it. Because if that's the issue, if these two underweight and bubble are linked together, then perhaps the solving of the underweight comes from deaeration of the product or so on. You have to really, really hone in on what you're observing. What I am observing in this data is perhaps my set point on here is a little bit too high and that this tapering off here goes to it pushes into 29 grams. We're giving away potentially three or four grams of mochi on every single unit. Not every single unit, but we're even giving away one gram on most units. And can we do something to pull in this um, distribution and reduce the spread? Because if we're making thousands upon thousands of mochi, we are giving away thousands upon thousands of grams of product, and that's product that we could and should be selling rather than giving away. These are the sorts of things that histograms can do for you and collecting. So again, what types of data do you need to be collecting? You need to be collecting numerical data. So frequency data, and in particular, this works well for weights, works well for numerical measures. So I could be, if I want to go back to my burnt toast, I could be collecting the um, L value on my toast to know how black my toast is if I burned it. Um, using an LAB meter, I could be measuring the, um, the size of the slice of toast to know that my bread is coming out at the right size. Most pan breads are going to come out at the right size, but if I was doing a free-formed loaf, I might want to know that the spread on my loaf wasn't going to be so big that it wouldn't fit in the package anymore. What other kinds of frequency data is useful? Um, granulation size is, is not uncommon. Um, you could be doing things like um, tightness of seams on cans to see how tight your seams are and make sure that you're within a tolerance. We are going to be doing shoe heart charts um, in a in one of the next videos as well and that's where we can start to do statistical process control on our frequency data. So histograms work really really well for numerical data and it allows us to see this sort of spread. There are histogram tools that ASQ has out there that relate to instead of our bins being the, the categorization of the spread of the data, but it, you can also the, use the histogram tool for sorting by days or time slots as well. 
Let's jump back to my slideshow here. I'm not going to edit this out. You guys are patient with me. It'll save me some time. Normally the time we see normal distribution and normal distribution, that's where we're seeing that classic bell curve. And that's where we've got a, a central tendency and we've got uh, a mean. And then we can see based off of the distribution, the standard deviation ideal situation you have a really really sharp thin curve and that standard deviation the variance within that data sometimes we see really really long and flat curves and that's where we want to be looking at core questions how can we reduce the variation within that data but normal distributions are the most common now sometimes you see skewed distributions they can be right or left skewed and in the case of right skewed it's usually you've got zero as your axis down here and therefore things can't go below zero and that tendency then leans here where you that tapering off uh, pardon me <laughs> i'm not a statistician i'm a i'm a food commercialization person so um in this skewness almost all the time it's because you've got your x-axis is as zero here and things cannot decrease below zero. What's next? Bimodal or double peak distribution. That's where you often have two mixed data sets uh, combining. I, um, those of you who did uh, the case study with me on Tiny's jars and they had a dual piston head, um, a dual piston filler for the uh, jam and barbecue sauce or the honey and barbecue sauce. If you map that data out in a histogram, you would see bimodal data. Um, I realize that my chemistry students haven't done histograms, but that's okay. Why would you see bimodal data? Well, we have two different piston heads, and each of those piston heads is calibrated to a different point. And in that case, you've got bimodal data where you see two discrete means being expressed in this situation. And the calibration quite often is off on one of the systems. Plateau distribution. This is where you're starting to see a mixing and there's not a really discrete mean within that distribution. Again, oftentimes if you have multiple filling heads or multiple depositors or multiple mills uh, creating product and each of them is poorly calibrated, you'll start to see this sort of plateau where multiple means are emerging and they're because each of them is its own normal distribution, they overlap so much that they start to merge into this flat top. Edge peak distribution, this is oftentimes where you have a, within your data you'll say, um, let's say this is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then you'll have a section where it says greater than, and this would be the greater than ten, and it's often just a defect in how the data is being managed. And so if you are using greater than or less than as one of your data collection points or one of the bins within your histogram, that's what you can start to see happening. Comb distribution, that these are histograms where the bins are offset. And so let's say we collected, we collected data by whole numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But within the data analysis, this is not uncommon. If you do not set the number of bins appropriately, the data may be manipulated such that it will be pushed into decimal points and you'll start to see these fake artifacts showing up within the data. Do make sure to dig into how histograms are designed and don't just rely on Excel to do it for you make sure that you are really understanding. And again, there's lots and lots of videos out there on how to create histograms in Excel. But if you see this sort of artifact, it likely is a sorting artifact within the bins, not that your data is somehow coming out with these weird comb-like teeth sticking out. Truncated or heart cut distribution. This is where, um, this often is seen by uh, uh, quality control technicians who are doing input evaluation. So you receive a product coming in from another supplier and 
let's say that supplier was doing its own um, product sorting, they may be uh, pulling the heads and tails off of that data and just giving you the central, the central product based off of their own sorting. That's not a bad thing. It's, it's just something that you can often see within a histogram managed um, system that your supplier will have poor control within their own manufacturing processes. And so they're sorting the product so that you are getting exactly what you want within specification. Conversely, you could have what they call a dog food distribution. And in some cases, you'll just get one tail and other cases, you'll get both tails. But the idea being based off of this truncated distribution, someone needs to capture the value on those two ends that were cut out. And they call it dog food distribution because often these are the scraps and they're sent out for low value processing. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. For example, let's say you are processing fruits and vegetables and you are making, I don't know, maybe you want apples for applesauce and perhaps the grocery retailers want apples that meet a very discreet size tolerance. If you are making applesauce, you would be fine with apples that are very small or apples that are oversized. And that would be completely acceptable within your process because you're just going to squish them anyways. So dog food type distributions can be quite acceptable within food uh, manufacturing scenarios as long as it's realistic to the types of operations. Again, weight is not a food safety issue. Now, if you came along and said, we have a distribution in terms of uh, different tolerances on microbial safety, and perhaps let's jump back to that normal distribution. Let's say we have this sort of microbial distribution on a product. You don't want to be getting the high end product that wouldn't meet tolerances. We do see it happen where people, um, manufacturers will take product that doesn't meet microbial standards and they will then try to send it out to jurisdictions where microbial standards are not as strict as they are in Canada. And honestly, I don't think that's a really good scenario, but I can also understand why companies would take products that do not meet their microbial standards and then try and repurpose them in a different marketplace. So we've got all of these different types of distributions that you might see within a histogram. And again, my outcome here is that you can take an existing tool for using and modeling histograms and collect frequency data, and plug it in and be able to make recommendations based off of what you see. Hoping that this was helpful for you and you know my approach, always reach out with questions. I love to hear your recommendations for what video I should make next. And for those of you who are following in the course, there are um, some associated readings and I've downloaded the templates for you so that you can do some work with them and use them for different measurements that you might be doing with my class or Norm's class or some of the other classes out there. All right, reach out with questions, take care and have fun making histograms. Cheers.